Marty Nemco, this is, uh, these are three stories from my book, Work Stories. They're about three minutes long each. Uh, one is about a, an old guy, a concert pianist, giving his last concert. Uh, another is about somebody sitting in a bar trying to figure out what the hell he wants to do with his life, young guy. And the third is a story truly based on real life that is uh, about a teacher, uh, all of which should surprise you in some ways. Hope you enjoy them. <coughs> First one is called Sam's Last Concert. In the wings, Sam could hear the concertmaster tuning up the orchestra. Damn, my, my hand is shaking more than usual. It's a bad Parkinson's day. Plus, it's my last concert. I'm, I'm nervous. I'm glad I decided on the Moonlight Sonata, but with these hands, nothing's easy. Sam had been a concert pianist his whole life. At age 11, he finished fourth in the Midwest Regional Young Artists Competition, and now at age 83, had performed 45 concerts, including one with the Kansas City Symphony. He thought, eh, true, that was just in the KC Symphony Summer Festival when lots of the A players were on vacation, well, but still. Huh. Somehow I wish my ex-wife were here. How could she have dumped me? I still wish you were here tonight. Do I play it safe? If I make a lot of no mistakes, it's going to make the audience think I stayed at it too long, like those star baseball players who would rather hit 200 than retire. Or do I go for a home run? A chance at a write-up in the Kansas City Star. Roseman finishes with a flourish. The conductor gave Sam a forced smile, and he strode on stage. That is, the conductor did. Sam is still standing in the wings. Okay, this is it. Deep breaths, deep breaths. Oh, my hands are shaking more. Oh, I'm taking too long. I got to get out there. Stand up straight. Old men hunch. Stride, don't shuffle. But Sam could manage only to shuffle on stage. Okay, this is it. All right, I can, I can stall a little bit here. I can just adjust my little seat here. And now this is it. Okay, Moonlight Sonata. Let's see if we can do it. Breathe. <coughs> uh, uh, okay.
Yeah, okay. 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 <clears throat> I made a few note mistakes, but I'm hoping that only the ignorant or the mean spirited could criticize my playing. After all, 85, 83 years old, advanced Parkinson's. Uh, huh. And yeah, I got not just the usual obligatory extended applause, bestowed as much to protest classical music's dying popularity as to acknowledge me, but fervent applause. And then, yeah, a standing ovation. Not a charity ovation, a heartfelt one, it seemed. And usually I was too shy to look at the applauding audience, so I'd stare in the back wall. I soaked in the smiling, standing people. And then I plodded off the stage for what I thought would be the last time. And I shuffled into my dressing room, I closed the door, dropped into a chair, and I thought, oh, I survived. I didn't embarrass myself. Oh, but I can't go to the reception. <laughs> That's like a retirement party where everyone tries to make light of it being the beginning of the end. My end. And then there was a knock at the door. <clears throat> Daddy? My daughter opened the door and she got, You were amazing. You are really amazing. Come on. They're all waiting for you. I knew there was no avoiding it, so I trudged downstairs. And when I arrived, the chatter morphed into applause, and I thought, oh, no one likes long speeches and nothing ungracious. I should be a good boy. But I couldn't resist saying what I really felt. Honestly, I can't stand the thought that this is going to be my last performance. And I teared up. <clears throat> At that moment, a four-year-old toddled up to me. Do you want to play in my class? And I went on to play more concerts than I had in my entire life, in preschools and elementary schools, first just locally and then around the country. I never got paid. Indeed, I had to pay my travel expenses, but I didn't mind. I can't think of a better way to spend my money than to teach young kids to love classical music and that old people aren't necessarily irrelevant. And anyway, that story is called Sam's Last Concert. The next story I'd like to read to you, no music involved, is called, it's about somebody uh, trying to choose a career. It's, it, I'm calling this, the story is called Behind Doors 1, 2, and 3. And again, it's from my book, Work Stories, available on Amazon, as they say. <clears throat> I sat in my usual spot at the graduate, the appropriately named Berkeley Dive Bar that caters to 20-somethings that prefer to drink and maybe think in a quiet rather than deafening bar or sit stoned at home. At some point, a guy sat next to me, but I didn't notice. I was thinking, what the hell should I do for a career? I had graduated six months ago and did the cliché trip, you know, Europe plus Nepal, and I came back no clearer on a career direction, let alone a path to enlightenment. Oh, I sat with my Long Island iced tea. That's a drink that gives big buzz per buck. Oozing into my softened brain, was an image of three doors, like in the old TV game show, Let's Make a Deal. And the host said to me, For you, a special deal. I'll show you what's behind all three doors. The catch is, you have to figure out which is actually best for you. Behind door number one, writer. I picture my debut book, Handled, about how good people become bad politicians because of their handlers. It won the National Book Award and Nobel Peace Prize, and I was interviewed on both CNN and Fox, New York Times, and Wall Street Journal. It sold 10 million copies. I donated 95% of the profits to the Foundation for Government, Ethical Government. Or, I spend five years procrastinating and finally finish writing the damn book, but all the agents and publishers ghost me. So I work at a cafe, including cleaning up the toilets, and even with two roommates, I can't make the rent, so I'm homeless. Behind door number two is Investment Banker. By age 30, I'm legendary for bringing amazing new products to the public. The Z Phone, which makes the iPhone obsolete. Insta House, which builds lovely homes in one day for $20,000. And Vivace, 
a drug that increases health span by 10 years. I'm worth $50 million and donate 95% to the National Association for Gifted Children. Or I applied to all 12 first tier and all 26 lesser investment banking firms. I got a total of one screening interview and was screened out. I'm now a bank teller. Behind door number three is fundraiser. After taking a few sales courses, I got hired as an assistant fundraiser at my university. But because I exceeded my annual quota uh, in the first month, I was promoted to fundraiser. And when I did it again, was promoted to trainer of fundraisers. And when all my trainees quickly exceeded quota, I became director of development. And then there was a bidding war for me among some of the nation's most prestigious nonprofits. I now make $2 million a year and was named International Fundraiser of the Year. Or the only job I could get after taking those expensive sales courses was as a door-to-door -door solicitor for Save the Snail Daughter. Door after day, was door was slammed in my face, and after a month, I had raised only $172. They fired me. I woke from my reverie to finally notice the guy sitting next to me. He said, you look deep in thought. And I said, yeah, I've been thinking about what career to pursue. And he replied, you know, I'm the manager of a soybean processing plant, and I could use an assistant. Interested? I said, what the hell? And the truth is that many people just fall into their jobs like that or into their careers. And anyway, in any event, that story is called Behind Doors number one, two, and three. The final story I want to read to you is called The Dose of Reality, again from my book Work Stories. This story is essentially true. I've only changed irrelevant details. <clears throat> Tom got a doctorate in education, and everyone was sure he'd become a professor preparing graduate students for a career as a K-12 teacher. But in Tom's field work, it was clear to him that he was far from a master teacher. He couldn't even control difficult students. Tom had learned a lot of theory, but too little that was practical. So after completing his doctorate, he decided he needed to get practical experience to see if he could become a good teacher. So he took a job in one of Boston's high schools that is sanitizingly called Challenged. It soon became clear to Tom that many of the students, especially the active boys, had a hard time sitting through a 50-minute period, and especially the double periods that education experts advocate. So Tom decided that during a double period, he would take his class on a little field trip. The problem was that half the students didn't return the parent permission slip. It wasn't that the parents weren't willing to sign, that slips too often didn't get to the parents. Tom's students said they lost it, their parents were away, and so on. He gave them another permission slip to get signed, but still many didn't come back. So Tom decided to try a trip with all the kids, even those that didn't have a permission slip. And he thought, eh, it's just at a nearby tide pool. And he rented a 15-person van and packed his class into it. If a bit scrunched, they'd all fit in the van, because while his class size was officially 22, on an average day only 15 would show. And everyone had a great time. And to ensure that they were addressing the mandated Common Core curriculum, they discussed and Tom gave assignments that tied the trip to academic learning. So a week later, they did another trip. This time it was a behind-the-scenes tour of a bakery. Another success. Unfortunately, the third time, <clears throat> when the kids were getting into the van, this time to go to a museum, the principal saw them aghast. Mr. Johnson, don't you know that our insurance doesn't cover that? And did you get permission slips from all the parents? Tom murmured, no. She pulled him aside and said, I am initiating termination procedures. You are endangering our students. Of course, Tom was sad, scared, but also angry. He wanted to prioritize his students, and as a result, he was getting fired. So that very Friday, he asked his class, who'd like to spend the weekend at my apartment with my family? Nearly everyone raised their hand. There wasn't enough room in Tom's apartment for all the students, but his classroom aide volunteered to let some stay with her. The next morning, Tom asked his aide, so how did it go? She said, two of them raped me. Tom lamented not just the loss of his job, but that he had tried so hard to be a good teacher, and his aide was so kind, so patient. How could two of their students do that? How dare they? Tom thought, I'm not sure what to believe anymore. The teachers' union defended Tom, but he lost his job anyway. He thought about taking some innocuous job like clerk in a bookstore, but accepted a position at a university, training prospective students. 
In any event, that story is called A Dose of Reality. All three of those stories, Sam's Last Concert, Behind Door Number 1, 2, and 3, and The Dose of Reality are from my book, um, Work Stories, available on Amazon. As usual, I welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. Oh, I'm sorry. This is ah, amazing. Anyway, sorry you didn't see my face, but you didn't need to see it anyway. Anyway, um, I welcome your thumbs up, accept your thumbs down. Always look forward to your comments, and especially like it if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel, and certainly you can well, you can check out any of my books on Amazon. or have written 27, um, from How to Do Life to Work Stories, Relationship Stories. In any event, I thank you for watching. I'm Marty Nemco.